Hey, Nick back with another Photoshop tutorial. And in this video, I wanna show you how to digitally color your drawings. And I think this will be especially cool for anybody that uh, draws or doodles really at any level. You can be a, a beginner doing like stick figures or you know someone who is creating masterpieces. Uh, it'd be cool for you if you've ever wondered, hey, how can I bring this into the computer and get it digitally colored and cleaned up so that it's looking really nice and professional. Um, I'm gonna show you now uh, in the field of graphic design or really, I guess, kind of like anything creative, uh, there's always a lot of different ways to get uh, the same or a similar result. So all I'm going to be doing is sharing with you my own personal workflow, which is something that I've, you know, through a lot of trial and error kind of perfected and uh, over the years, and I really like um, how everything works and how everything comes together. So, you know, if you like to do this a different way, please share it in the comments. But um, I think you'll find it both easy and also very intuitive. Now, before we get started, uh, to do this technique, you will need both Photoshop and Adobe Illustrator. So for the most part, you know, everything that we're gonna be doing is really gonna be primarily done in Photoshop, but we will be using Illustrator for one very important, albeit pretty quick step. So you gotta have both of those. Um, I'm gonna be using Adobe CC 2014, Creative Cloud 2014, which is the brand new version. Uh, it's really great, everything runs pretty awesome so far, I have zero complaints. But I think if you're in an older version, you know, maybe even back to CS5 for sure, or newer. It's been a while since I've used CS3 or CS4, but you might be okay with those. So if you're in an older version, it's gonna look a little bit different on my screen. Basically, it's a, a black interface now. But um, So everything's gonna look a little bit different, but you know, a lot of the tools and techniques will be you know, in the same place, and they're also all gonna work very similar to if you're in an older version. So don't worry if you're in CS5, but uh, again, I'm gonna be using CC 2014. Now, just to kind of show you what we're gonna do here, um, this is the original sketch, all right? Just something I did really quickly on uh, a lunch break. Um, now, truthfully, you know, I love to draw. I've done it my whole life, but it, it's not my main area of expertise. It's just usually something that I do for fun. Um, as far as graphic design, what I do, doodling and illustration is not usually a huge part of it, although I do love to use uh, hand-drawn and hand-created elements in things like logos and branding and, and web design and that kind of thing. It's just, I've always loved the contrast of that kind of, you know, created by hand look mixed with digital elements. It's, uh, I always find it very pleasing. But um, yeah, this is uh, usually what I'm drawing. It's, it's strictly just for fun. Uh, I'm also working on an animated web series, which will hopefully launch probably early to mid 2015. It's still kind of a secret. Animating takes forever. It's driving me totally crazy. But I'm using these techniques a lot with that to create the characters and the background. So this is what we're going to start with. Um, now, if you want to, Again, any kind of drawing this technique is going to work with, but what I would recommend doing is, of course, usually start with pencil to do the outlines and, and that kind of thing, but I would recommend, and again, this is kind of personal preference, I like to do my inking on the actual page before it gets scanned in. Now, if you're familiar with Illustrator at all, um, you know, if you have a background in that program, by all means, you can usually just start with pencil on the paper and do all of your line work in the program, which also works great. But I do that sometimes, but sometimes I also like to just do the inking on the page because there's something you know a little bit more natural and organic about you know that line work happening on the page itself before it gets scanned in. So in this particular case, pencil drawing that was inked just using regular Micron ink pens, and then it was scanned in. Um, you do of course need a scanner for this process. Don't ever do this by trying to take a picture of your drawing. Just don't. It's going to look absolutely horrible, no matter what camera that you're using. Always scan it in. Um, you don't need an expensive scanner at all. I just use about a, you know, it's a, I think $69 Epson printer scanner combo. It works great. It just wirelessly sends the scans right to my computer. It's awesome. So you do need a scanner. And once I scan this in, just using a black and white setting, this is kind of what I have uh, going. A little drawing, again, just a lunch break doodle of Captain Nemo being attacked by the giant squid. 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, especially the Disney movie. It's always been one of my favorite stories, so sometimes just Captain Nemo pops out for no reason. And I thought, hey, this looks pretty cool, um, especially the beak. Squid beaks are terrifying, everybody. Um, so before the, you know, the first step to doing this is whenever you scan something in, especially if it was done in pencil, um, but again, try to ink this first, one of the main problems that you have before you start coloring is that your line work is uneven. And in this case, I can see that a lot of my uh, pen work is kind of sloppy. Uh, it's not you know, complete coverage. I can see some areas that are slightly grayish where you can see you know, the individual pen lines. And it, it just doesn't look 
really great. So what I want to do before we do, again, any kind of coloring or anything, is I'm just going to drag the scan into Photoshop. All right, it's going to open it up just like this. There we go. I can see my layers window. I've got one layer. That's that picture that we just opened up, my background. I'm going to hit the F key, which goes into full screen mode. Yeah, it's kind of personal preference, but I usually hate seeing the wallpaper when I'm working on anything visual because it's distracting. As awesome as Destiny is, I don't want to see it right now. Um, so I can see the picture. All right. I can use my zoom tool to uh, get up really close. You can see the scanner did a pretty good job. Whoa, that is that is way too close, especially going to that squid beak. Whoa. So what I want to do here in Photoshop is we're going to even out. Um, all the line work, basically turn anything that is black into pure black and anything that's white into pure white. And it's going to be done very, very easily. Uh, what we want to go for is in the adjustments layer, or sorry, the adjustments window right over here on the right. And if for whatever reason, if you don't have this window open, it should be open by default. But if not, just go up here to window and then adjustments. All right. If you're in an older version of Photoshop, uh, I think like CS3, you might have to go up to uh, layer new adjustment layer and the one that we're trying to do or the one we're going to use here is called levels all right but again i'm just going to click right over here where it says adjustments levels i can see i got a new layer that's been added above my background looking good so far so what levels is is just kind of a way to uh, i don't know fix exposure problems if you know certain things are too dark too light it's a pretty intuitive way to kind of fix those sort of issues so as soon as you click on that, a new layer appears, and what an adjustment layer is, without going into it like a huge tangent, is it's just that a layer, there's nothing actually on the layer, but it's a special effect or an adjustment that's going to be affecting anything that's underneath it. So in this case, this levels layer here is going to be affecting our background layer right below it. Now, I'm not going to get into a huge explanation of the levels uh, window here, but basically we have this graph here. This is called a histogram, and it's a graph of dark tones light or sorry middle tones and bright tones so if you see this big spike over here on the right that's because we have a lot of white blank page so there's a lot of bright tones there so if you ever want to do this just to kind of you know like i said even out your line work just to keep it simple take this little triangle here this is our mid tones and i'm just going to slowly move it over to the right and as you look at the picture you're going to start to see that all of the blacks are starting to get really nice and black all right looking pretty good Sweet. But the problem is that's darkening now the whole thing. So any kind of, uh, you know, random pencil marks or anything like that, if you're, you know, if you don't use, uh, like me, again, it was just a lunch break thing. I didn't have my uh, smudge guard glove on. There's a bunch of pencil marks all over the page. It looks terrible. So to fix that, we can bring the bright tones out to the left. And you can see it's actually working really well. Um, any of the white parts are getting you know, extra white, but the black parts are still kind of staying nice and pure and black, which is exactly what you want. Sometimes, you know, every photo is a, or every picture is a little bit different. Sometimes it's just a little bit of a balancing act between the mid-tones and the bright tones to find that sweet spot. But this looks pretty good, and I can see that, you know, for the most part, all the black is just beautiful, rich, pure black, which is looking good, and the white is white. There's still a couple of spots here that I can still see a little bit of page coming through, like right here, if I zoom in, you guys can see that right there. Also a little bit on the hat over here as well. So in this particular stage of the drawing, this is where I would go to my background layer. And just to be safe, I would probably make a new layer right above it. So an empty layer. And on this layer, I can just use my regular old paintbrush, okay? And I would recommend using a brush tip that um, you know, has a hard edge just like this one, this one, or that one. Really, any of those would work fine. Um, I don't have my Wacom tablet uh, hooked up, but I'd recommend getting one of those if you can. It makes really all this stuff a lot easier. Uh, mine's not hooked up because I have a new Cintiq on the way, which I'm super excited about. That's the one that's got the screen built in. I'm uh, really thinking it's going to change my life. I can't wait. So I've got my brush, and I, of course, have the color black selected right here. Uh, you can always, if you're on a Mac, you can just hit Option and it turns it into an eyedropper. I can click anywhere in the black and it will automatically select it. So now all I'm gonna do is just paint over those parts that look a little questionable, like on the hat. All right, because I am looking just for uh, 
pure black in all those places that are supposed to be pure black. Now you don't necessarily need to do this in, I guess, this phase. You could also do this later on as well, but why not get it out of the way? That way you don't have to worry about it. Just kind of, oops, my bad. And looking pretty good. Sweet. A little bit up here. And the bracket keys, if you don't know already, make the brush tip bigger and smaller. Uh, if you're using a Wacom tablet, definitely have that keyboard shortcut binded to one of the quick keys. You'll save so much time. All right, that's looking uh, a pretty decent, okay? Now, a lot of times when you scan something in, um, you know, especially if it's in part of a notebook, you've got some extra stuff on the sides that you just don't need. So I'm going to go over to my crop tool right here. And this is definitely one thing that will be a little bit different depending on the version of Photoshop that you're in. But I'm just going to kind of, um, I don't know if you can see that, but it's being super annoying. And it's popping all the way off to the right instead of letting me, you know, be very, uh, I don't know, discriminating with my selection. That's something called Snap. If you go up to Photoshop, View, turn Snap off. Um, Snap is a really useful feature that I do use a lot, but sometimes when you're trying to be very exact, it can be very frustrating. So I'm going to just kind of trim off a little bit from the bottom and also on the right side. And I'm just going to hit return. All right. So we just cut out that extra little bit there. Looking good. Now, the next step after we do this, because this is looking pretty darn good, uh, I don't necessarily want to start coloring right now because there's still some roughness to the lines. And it's also going to look a lot better if we just do this next very simple step, which is going to be just to bring it into Illustrator and give it a quick trace. So what I want to do before I bring things into Illustrator to trace them, uh, this is something you really just learn by trial and error. But if you start to bring um, a graphic into Illustrator to, uh, to trace, and we're going to be using the image trace feature, which is kind of like an automatic tracing. Uh, if the picture is too large, um, sometimes Illustrator will either take forever to do it or freak out and crash because it's, it's just too much. So um, I wouldn't recommend, like if I go up here to image and then image size, um, I can see that when I scan this in, it's actually a really, I mean, this is pretty high resolution image. It's 300 pixels per inch. And it's also, you know, 3000 pixels high. Uh, what I'm gonna do for Illustrator, just so everything runs a little bit better, and I'd, I'd recommend that you do the same thing. It's just, I'm gonna shrink this a little bit. I don't want to go too small because I can start to lose some of the details, but I'm just going to shrink it down to about 1500 pixels instead of 3000. So kind of like basically cutting it in half. Um, if you're going to do this, you know, again, every picture is a little bit different, but just make sure that whatever the smaller dimension is, whether it's the width or the height is somewhere around a thousand pixels and you should still keep a lot of detail there. And I'm going to click OK. It's going to shrink a little bit, which is all right. So what I'm going to do now is file save as and I'm just going to drop this right on my desktop and I'll call it like I don't know Nemo and I want to save it as a JPEG right. file save as JPEG um, I do want to keep the quality at the maximum because we don't want to lose any detail at all um, you know JPEGs always lose a little bit of, of detail in the compression but it's it's not super noticeable on most computer screens uh, all right so I got that set to 12 I'm going to click OK and now this picture is saved on our desktop as Nemo.jpg. Now, believe it or not, we actually don't need this anymore. So if you feel like you might need to make some changes to it, or if you're not feeling like super secure about this, uh, you know, this thing that we just created, by all means, do a quick file save and save it as a Photoshop file so that will keep all of the layers. So if you need to go back in and make any changes, it's pretty easy to do. But I'm feeling pretty good about it. I'm going to close it out. I'm not going to save it. But I now have this picture here on my desktop, Nemo.jpg. So again, if you wanted to see a quick, that's the old one. That's the new one. And you can see just by doing that little bit in Photoshop, all of the line work and the colors or the richness of the blacks looks much, much better. All right, next step, Illustrator. Open up Illustrator, pause the video if you need to. I've already got it open, so I'm just gonna move forward. I'm going to go into Illustrator and I'm just going to do File Open. And right on my desktop here, I got my Nemo.jpg. I'm going to open that up. There we go. Look at that. Uh, I'm going to click on it and actually make it a little bit larger. 
Yours may have actually popped up larger than this. Uh, it depends on what your document size is set to in Illustrator, but it doesn't matter too much. There we go. That looks pretty good. Awesome. I'm gonna zoom in just a little bit so you guys can see a little bit better. And now what we want to do here, again, we're not going to go into a, a huge tutorial with Illustrator because it's um, there's some similarities uh, between Photoshop and Illustrator, but you know I always kind of think about it like. Hey, if you already know how to speak Spanish, sometimes learning Italian can be a little frustrating because it's similar, but it's just different enough to be incredibly annoying. And that's kind of the way Illustrator is with Photoshop. Um, there's some things in Photoshop that, um, you know, their counterparts in Illustrator are really frustratingly complex. So it can be kind of an annoying program to switch over if you're, you know, someone who's really just spent all their time in Photoshop. But it's not too bad. Don't be afraid. I'd really recommend getting into Illustrator. It's a pretty damn cool program. But anyways, let's move back to this. Uh, what we're looking for is we want to have a window open called Image Trace. So go up to Window, Image Trace, right here. And this is this window right over here. All right. Now, if you're in an older version of Illustrator, uh, I believe, again, it's been a while since I've used anything but uh, CC or CS6, um, sometimes that is not there. So I believe you may have to go up to Object and Image Trace. And then, actually, you know what? Image Trace. I believe there should be an option in older versions of Illustrator here to uh, something like Image Trace Options or something like that. Again, if you remember what that is, uh, please let me know in the comments. I would appreciate it. That would be awesome. So what we're going to do now is use this feature in Illustrator called Image Trace, which is going to basically completely redraw this picture in um, what's called vector art. All right. Now it's going to look um, a little bit different. We're going to lose a little bit of detail, but we're going to lose in detail. We're going to gain in line clarity. It's all going to look very nice and clean. And some of the dirt that we see here is just going to look a little bit better. I can definitely see that my uh, black that I covered was not the best black to use, apparently. So I will actually fix that in the next step pretty quickly. Not too bad. Um, so right here in this image trace window, we do want to stick with black and white. All right. Now, we can always... Um, anytime you're doing black and white image tracing, it's not usually too terribly taxing on your computer, so you can use the preview feature. And watch what happens when I click preview. It's going to pixel clustering, boundary refinement, there we go. So I can see there that it's definitely changed quite a bit. If I go back to that, and let me go back to preview. You can see we lost a lot of detail, but all the lines look a lot cleaner. And you know, I guess what you would consider to be a little bit more professional. Now, when it comes to this kind of technique, you know, my goal, uh, who I would consider to be kind of like the, the pinnacle of this, and you know, a testament to his ability, because you know he was doing this with actual ink and and that kind of thing was uh, Bill Watterson and, and Calvin and Hobbes, which is still just one of the most gorgeous comics just ever created, both in the writing, quality of storytelling, but also just the art was absolutely amazing. So we kind of have that really nice, clean, uh, really solid black lines, which um, I'm always a fan of. I think it looks really great. But the problem is we've lost too much detail. So this technique is relatively simple, but there are you know a couple of things you really need to keep in mind. The first one is there's this basic control called threshold. And this is going to be basically the amount of blacks or the amounts of uh, whites in this picture. Every drawing is going to be a little bit different. But watch what happens when I start to play with this. I can see that if I move it over to the right, I'm actually losing uh, even more of the bright parts so the blacks are starting to take over. And what I want to do is kind of find like this sweet spot where I still have a pretty good amount of detail. Like that's looking a little bit better. If you notice, um, what I'm really looking at is his beard because yeah, I created a, a, a nice texture there and I want to make sure that that stays intact. And also, too, with some of the other things, like uh, you know the frills on his uh, uniform here, and also some of the details in the suckers and, and that sort of thing, and the handle of the uh, crazy fishing knife up here at the top. Okay, good. Oof. Ouch, that would hurt. Um, so you got to try and find that this sweet spot with the threshold that you like. And then you can move on to the advanced features, which really aren't terribly complex. Um, for the most part, I almost always have the paths set to between 95 and 100%. And watch what happens when I do that. Um, it's not dramatic all the time, but a lot of those uh, little details will come back. And I'm going to actually 
There we go. I'm gonna move that threshold up just a little bit to, I guess around 50. We'll see what happens. There we go. Cool, that looks pretty good. So I usually have the path set to about 98% and the noise always at one pixel. There we go. So what you can see there with one pixel is that cleaned it up a lot. All right, so if you remember, we were kind of somewhere around here just a second ago. Yeah, and just, I mean, just watch the details in his beard and his face with the noise at one pixel. It looks much, much better. All right, so now the important part here is this little option that a lot of people might glance over. It's called Ignore White. And this is, uh, in my opinion, probably the most important part when it comes to digitally coloring your drawings. And you'll see why in just a sec. So what Ignore White does is basically this drawing, which was originally two colors just a second ago, is a white background with black ink, is now literally just black. And if I drag it, again, using my uh, the main selector tool in Illustrator, if you've never opened it before, it's just this black arrow up here. It's called the selection tool. If I drag this over on top of the background here, because it's, again, kind of hard to see over the white page because it looks almost the same. But if I drag it over here, I can see that my drawing has been turned into literally just the black outlines. All right, so, you know, not to get into too much of what we're about to get into, but that means that I can, almost like a coloring book where, uh, you know, the border lines are solid black and you don't have to be, you know, 100%, like right to the pixel perfect when you're doing your coloring. That's what we're gonna be able to do in just a sec because we're gonna be able to color underneath this drawing. Um, so this is kind of exactly what I want my drawing to look like. It looks pretty damn good. All right. Now what I want to do is, if I'm feeling good about this, I want to go up to File, Save As, and I'm just going to title this really the same thing, Nemo, but I want to save it as a file called an EPS. Um, in you know these days, you can actually drop most things just as a .ai right into Photoshop, but I still like to use EPS because it's a little bit quicker. <clears throat> All right, cool. So all the lines are a lot cleaner and not to go into a huge tangent, but if you're wondering, hey, why did we do this versus just working with the one that was in Photoshop? Uh, in addition to the lines being cleaner, Illustrator is what's called a vector art program. And uh, you can obviously look up a little bit more in depth the difference between raster art and vector art, but Photoshop is a raster program. And basically what that means is, you know, something is a certain size and you can shrink it, but if you ever try and enlarge it, you're gonna to start to lose quality because, you know, that detail is just, it's just not there. But stuff that you do in Illustrator, really anything, especially when you even just bring it in and live trace it like this, um, all of these lines and colors and everything are being mathematically calculated and that means that they're actually scalable. So if I wanted to use this illustration that I just created here, even though my original page when I scanned it in was only about eight and a half by 11, I could technically use this on a billboard and it's gonna retain you know, really all of that quality, which is, which is great. And that means your illustrations are gonna look a lot cleaner than if you had just stuck to Photoshop. Anyways, feel free to look up uh, raster versus vector. If you got any questions you know, throughout any of this, just feel free to ask me in the comments and I will get back to you. Uh, in a couple of weeks, I'm gonna be getting married and gone off the grid for a couple of weeks, so I won't be able to respond, but I will get back to them as soon as I return. I'm gonna go up to Illustrator and I'm gonna quit because we got that saved as Nemo.eps, which is right up here in the top corner of my screen. So let's just take a look at our progression here. This was my first one. This was after bumping it up in Photoshop using the levels. And then this is after using Illustrator. All right. And if you notice, um, remember a minute ago, I had noticed that the black that I had used was not quite right, which uh, not to get into technical difficulty or technical stuff, but it's basically because the color mode in Illustrator was uh, a different color mode. But using that live trace feature, it actually fixed that problem for me automatically, which is great. All right. So that is kind of like the initial setup before you get into the coloring, all right? I'm gonna now go back to Photoshop and I'm gonna make a new document. And you know, the size of the document you make is pretty much up to you. Uh, just to kind of keep it simple and make it make sense in the video, I'm just gonna do 1920 pixels by 1080 pixels, basically 1080p. 
And I'm going to keep the resolution to 72. So this is basically, imagine a movie frame that would be uh, I don't know, like a Blu-ray menu or something in a 1080p movie. And I'm just going to click OK. Now, if you wanted to do this for print, you could obviously just pick any different size document. The, uh, the beautiful thing about creating that EPS in Illustrator and doing that part is that really that can be scaled and drop into any project perfectly. And it's going to look just as clean and crisp. Now, the only thing I would recommend is if you plan on doing this for whatever reason in a larger format, like on a, a printed page or anything like that, to always go big first. Don't start small and then work big. Uh, just go right to like the full size that you want to create it in. So anyways, I'm going to go up to File, Place, and we're going to bring in that picture of, uh, of Nemo. Again, so here it is, Nemo.eps, and I'm going to place it in. And I'm just going to hold shift and use the corners, of course. You never want, you know, Nemo to like, that looks like crap. Don't ever do that. Don't ever do that. Yikes. So let me just place it again. There we go. Nemo.eps, placing it in. Okay. Uh, that's blue. What am I doing? A little too big. Yikes. Eh, a little bit smaller, maybe. Okay, cool. That looks pretty good. Sweet. All right. So now in the final version of this, the one that I actually showed, and I'll show it again here really quick, um, I had done some extra work a little bit. Um, I had redrawn the actual tentacle out here so that extended uh, beyond what my page dimension or uh, page cutoff was when I first scanned it in. Uh, I also did some coloring to this tentacle down here at the bottom to fill that in because right now it is just kind of empty white. But essentially, for the most part, everything else was done um, right here. So the next step is technically just to kind of like jump in and start doing the coloring. But just a couple of things really quick. First, um, when you're coloring stuff, the, the palette and the colors that you're choosing are, are very, very important. Um, what's cool about the technique that we're about to do is that it makes changing your colors after the fact actually really easy. So it's not something you have to you know, really freak out or sweat about when you just get started. You can, you know, play around with the colors later. That's honestly what I usually like to do is just get some placeholder colors that are like kind of there and then later on kind of worry about recoloring the whole thing. So at the moment, it kind of looks like it originally did with the white background, but it's important to remember that if we just kind of turn this eyeball off on the background layer, I can see, hey, it's just the black outlines, which is exactly what I want. And check it out, if I pick a color and then I fill in using Option Delete that background layer, you can really start to see that it's just the, just the um, sorry, just that black outline, which is good. That's exactly what we want. Awesome. So, let's color something. Let's, uh, let's kind of zoom in here. And I'm gonna just do some of the green slime really quickly on this squid beak, all right? We're gonna start kind of simple, green slime, all right. So this top layer, your graphic, or whatever your drawing is. Um, now you don't have to if you're somebody that's good at remembering, but it's always a good idea just to make sure that that layer really should always be on the top, okay? I am now going to make a new layer, and I'm going to call it squid goo, question mark? Sure, sounds gross. And I'm gonna pick a color for my squid goo. I'm gonna pick like this, uh, really horrible, and I'm using my swatches window up here at the top right. I'm gonna pick this really ugly kind of greenish color. Here is, if you care, here's the hex code if you wanna uh, use that color or not. Don't feel pressured like you have to use the disgusting green color. Um, I think my inspiration for this was uh, every time Calvin, poor Calvin, his mom cooks for him, his food usually comes to life. It's usually a color very similar to this, pretty disgusting. And um, the tool that I'm using is just the regular paintbrush. I want to make sure that I am using a hard edge brush, basically any brush that has the hardness set to 100% because I want some really nice uh, clean lines. And um, again, I'm using the swatches window up here. Uh, if you're doing digital coloring if, you know, at any regularity, you need to be using the swatches panel all the time. All right, You can select any color here in the color picker just by clicking at the bottom of your toolbar. And you can either click the link here that says add to swatches or you can click this little button right over here by the trash can and it will do the same thing. 
Basically swatches, you probably know this already, but they're just quick access colors that you can choose anytime. Which usually if you're doing digital coloring is just a lifesaver. It saves you a ton of time just to be able to click, oh, that color, that color, that color, and you can jump to it very, very quickly. Um, there's a lot of people that I know, um, and I do this sometimes, where you can actually, because the eyedropper is a beautiful tool in Photoshop, you could do like that color, that color, that color. And it's, uh, it's kind of like, you know, if you ever watch Bob Ross or something like that, where he's got his, uh, he's doing his happy little trees and he's, he's pulling the paint in. He just kind of has these like quick access paints so that he's holding in his hand. And again, the option key turns into an eyedropper so you can always just click. But that part's up to you. A lot of times I just use the swatches panel because it's not terribly difficult to just click right up there. So, got my paintbrush. I've got my horrible green color selected, and I'm gonna start painting in some of this squid goo. And I'm gonna do that. All right, now that looks absolutely terrible. All right, and if I tried to go in and, you know, using a smaller brush, like do this manually by hand, like I could kind of sort of get there. It looks okay. Uh, but, well, it doesn't really look okay. It looks kind of terrible. But the beauty of this technique is that I can just kind of paint like that, all right? Looks really stupid. But if I take this layer, the squid goo, which is the layer that I just colored on, and I drag it underneath my drawing, that color is only gonna show in that area that's white. So again, it's kind of like a coloring book in that way. And that's really only because we brought it into Illustrator and did that tracing technique where we are able to get rid of the, uh, you know, just get rid of that white completely. You know, this is all we have is this black outline. So what's cool now is that I can actually just paint and it's only going to appear in those areas that are white. Now there's definitely certain times where you do have to get a little bit more uh, detailed. Like if I wanted to do this uh, little string of, of squid goo right over here, um, honestly, I'd probably zoom in. There we go, squid goo, gross. All right, a little more squid goo. Okay, I'm gonna color a little bit more. I'm gonna do some happy little squid goo. There we go. All right, so again, it's great because you don't have to like sweat every single pixel. You can be a little sloppy and it's still gonna look really good. So this technique you can pretty much do for um, you know, every little section on this, uh, this painting or this drawing. Now, technically, if you wanted to kind of keep this really simple, like for example, if you had no plans on doing any kind of shading, then you could actually do all of the coloring on one single layer in Photoshop. This could be called squid goo and everything else. All right, it's gonna be my solo CD title right there. Uh, let's say I wanna do, oh, I don't know, we'll go ahead and start coloring in the squid tongue. It's been a while since I've looked at a squid tongue. I don't know what color it is. It's been a while. I won't drag you through a Google image to look for that right now. But let's say I wanted to color that in. That's looking pretty good. Nice. Nice. All right. Looking solid. Now, because this is the same layer, if I am, uh, you know, you do have to be a little neat with this. So if I accidentally kind of went over here, it's going to cover up that green, which is not quite what I'm going for. So if you're not doing any shading at all, you can do all of the coloring on one layer. It's gonna look really nice and clean and crisp. And if you do a good job with picking a color palette that fits and you're clean with all of your brush strokes, you will end up with a really nice, clean, beautiful illustration. So if that's you, guess what? You're done, you can stop right now. But if you have any interest in doing any kind of shading, shading is where it gets really fun. Um, let's take a look at how to do some shading. All right. Now to do shading, this is kind of the tricky part. There might be some parts of your illustration that don't need shading. Like for example, the squid goo, all right? Um, I'm not necessarily going for a super photorealistic look here, so I'm not really gonna add any shading to the squid goo. But there might be certain parts, like for example, the tongue, where I would want the tongue section here in the front to be a little bit brighter than the tongue section in the back. So let me show you a little intro to uh, my technique here. All right, I'm gonna actually make a new layer. I'm gonna call it tongue, that's how you spell tongue, right? 
I haven't had any coffee yet, so um, hopefully my spelling's okay. So I've got this uh, layer here called Tongue. And I'm going to, I still have that color selected. I'm just going to go ahead and, and paint the whole thing. All right, I'm going to do a little better job than that. So basically for this technique, what I would say is that anything that you want to have shaded, make sure that it's on its own layer. All right. So make a new layer every time you want to start coloring in something that will eventually be shaded. So I've got this uh, layer here called tongue, right? And it's just this, the tongue, sweet. For shading, I want to make a new layer right above it. Now I call it something like tongue shading. Now the trick is, and I'll show you another example of this in just a sec, um, I want to make sure that that layer, that's my shading, is set to a clipping mask. And I do that just by right click right here anywhere in the layers window and then select create clipping mask. Clipping masks in Photoshop are basically something that tells the program, hey, this layer that I'm on will only appear over the layer that's underneath. So for example, if I pick a color to shade my tongue with, all right, uh, let's see here, I'm gonna go to my eyedropper, use that same color and just kind of pick a darker shade of it. Oh, that's pretty good. Um, if I'm painting anywhere else, I'm clicking and I'm painting over here, this is not gonna show up because this layer, and if I turn the clipping mask off just to show you, that looks pretty terrible. Harold and his purple crayon went totally crazy there. Uh, so I'm gonna turn it back to a clipping mask, and what that basically means is that I can be super messy now because that layer is only going to appear over that tongue layer. So basically like the way that this would work if you were gonna be illustrating or, or coloring this whole drawing is that any layer that doesn't need shading is literally just, sorry, just squid goo, all right? Just the squid goo, awesome. Anything that's going to be shaded would have its own layer, but then also a layer above it that's a clipping mask, and that's where you're gonna be doing the shading. All right. Hopefully that kind of makes a little bit of sense. Let's see if we can do uh, one more quick example of that. Uh, if you feel like you got this, by all means, feel free to uh, go ahead and turn the video off. Um, but if you wanna see one more example, let's take a quick look. Uh, if anybody wants to check out any of my stuff, um, I do have a website, uh, it's casalegraphicdesign.com. Uh, you can check it out, a bunch of my work's on there. I got a blog, um, also do, there's some other Photoshop tutorials and other cool things on there as well. Uh, I've got some other tutorials on my YouTube channel as well, so feel free to check those out. So let's do some shading, um, let's see here. Okay, we're gonna do something that's a little bit larger and this is a one time when, well, definitely one time when clipping masking is, or clip, oh my God, I need that coffee. One time when using clipping masks to do your shading is uh, is really, really nice. So I'm gonna call this one Tentacle Body. Why not? I'm gonna color this big tentacle right here, okay? And then I'm gonna shade it. So I'm gonna pick a color up here. Um, I think this was the color that I used on this. Yeah, it's pretty close. And I'm just gonna go ahead and, and color this in. Again, this is another great time when this technique is awesome because you've got a little bit of leeway when it comes to your lines. It's looking good. Sweet. All right, cool. Now let me just finish up the bottom part here. All right, so we wanna do some shading on this tentacle. I'm gonna make a new layer right above it Call it tentacle body shading, why not? And I'm going to right click on it and turn it into a clipping mask. And I'm gonna pick a color that's just a darker shade of that same color, which you know, probably that might work pretty good. Um, by the way, that uh, technique, if you're ever wondering, it's not, it doesn't always work, but sometimes if you, let's say, this is the main color, and you wanna find a good color to shade, uh, shade it, you can hold down shift and drag down on the color picker and it will just kind of, keeps it generally the same tone but just gets darker. It doesn't work all the time but it can sometimes be pretty cool. So if I was trying to shade this and it was not a clipping mask, all right, you can kind of see the look that we're going for but I got all this extra stuff. And if I tried to do the shading with a smaller brush, um, I could probably do it 
It's definitely a little bit easier with the Wacom tablet. But uh, I'm going to turn that back into a clipping mask, and now I can use a larger brush. Ooh, look at that. And I can just kind of paint like that. It looks pretty good. All right, now that's definitely a little bit of trial and error. It takes a while to perfect um, your shading. That looks pretty good. Um, pretty awesome. Sweet. So from here on out, it's really just a whole lot of uh, lathering, rinsing, and repeating. It's kind of the same process over and over again. Again, make a layer for whatever it is that you want to color, and then make a layer right above it, turn it into a clipping mask, and then use that layer for the darker, or I guess technically you use it for a lighter color as well, as far as shading or uh, brightening. And then just that over and over again, and you can color your entire piece. Definitely a little bit of trial and error, and um, you know, if you have any questions at all, feel free to ask below, and I will do my best to get to them. And just to kind of show you what this looks like when it's finished, uh, let me switch over to a different Photoshop project here. There we go. Uh, this was what I ended up with when I finished coloring everything. And of course, when I first started, I had just picked some uh, colors that I uh, honestly sucked. They were kind of ugly. And then afterwards, I went back through and recolored them. And um, just to show you really quickly how you can basically do that is we go back to this and I'm like hey you know what that's squid goo I kind of hate that color you could do it a couple different ways you can obviously just select that layer for squid goo and then paint in a different color All right that looked terrible I right, do that again so I'm like oh, I want to just use a different color for squid goo um, I prefer to use the layer style color overlay so if you go down to FX down here at the bottom Layer styles are just some basic effects that you can add to layers in Photoshop. This one is dead simple. All it does is it takes a solid color and overlays it over anything that's on that layer. In this case, what's on that layer is that color. So I can switch this to anything, really. So this is, uh, I found to be a really nice way to go back through and quickly recolor things. So that is the technique. Uh, if you got any questions, like I said, let me know. And uh, if we look here at this one, Again, this is what happened when it finished. And then you know, later on, I did put in a, uh, I guess, a background and some other effects to make it look a little bit more uh, tumultuous or whatever you want to call it, like it's actually happening on the seas. Um, but you can see here all my layers, they're set up very much the same way. Now, when I'm doing my own projects, I have a bad habit of not naming my layers all the time, although I try to always be very good about that. Sometimes I forget because the creative process, you know, sometimes it's just like, oh, I got to do this, I got to do that and you forget about the little stuff. So don't uh, avoid my mistakes. Try to name all of your layers. So hopefully this video helped you uh, in terms of digitally coloring your drawings. Uh, I've got a bunch of other tutorials on my channel and stay tuned for some new stuff coming up. Thank you for watching.